Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites, and today we're going to be looking at flax fibre and its use as a reinforcement. Now, flax is widely understood to be a more environmentally friendly and sustainable reinforcement option over traditional carbon and glass, and in this video we're going to be looking at its advantages and disadvantages. I'll also go on to demonstrate how you can process this material by doing a resin infusion on this chair moulding. So, what is flax fibre? Well, flax fibre comes from the stem of the flax or the linseed plant, and this is grown and harvested specifically for this fibre. After harvesting, the plant is threshed to remove the leaves and seeds before being soaked and dried, which breaks down the binders that hold the stem together. This is then processed through a series of rollers and combs to separate out and straighten the long, fine inner fibres from the outer parts, before finally being spun ready for weaving. Now there's nothing new about woven flax fabrics, in fact they've been produced for thousands of years and are the oldest known textile. But what makes them particularly good for composites is the long continuous cellulose fibres, which, for a natural fibre at least, offer excellent tensile strength and stiffness. There are other natural fibres that can be used, such as jute and hemp, but flax is the most common, down to the fact that it generally offers the best mechanical performance. So, what are the main advantages of using this material? Well, probably the most likely reason that you're going to be using flax is for its environmental credentials. Flax is claimed to use between two and five times less CO2 in production than an equivalent weight in glass. And you could probably also make the argument that it's carbon negative due to the carbon that's captured during its growth. So for markets that are environmentally conscious, such as outdoor sports equipment and home furnishings, using flax can meet their demands and really set your products apart. Another advantage of flax is its unique natural appearance. So you can see the sort of deep twill weave effect that we've got on this seat moulding. And I'm going to be demonstrating infusion on this particular part in a few moments. Uh, from a previous video, we've got the infusion that we did on this skateboard with another woven fabric. The snowboard top sheet that we've got here, this is using a unidirectional fabric, which not only looks great, but also takes advantage of another property of flax, which is its excellent vibration damping, making it perfect for high vibration applications like skis and snowboards, but it also has its use in sound attenuation and acoustics. That covers the main advantages of using this material, but what are its disadvantages? Well, primarily this comes down to mechanical performance. There are some creative numbers out there that claim that flax can perform as well as glass fibre, but honestly, in our experience, this simply isn't the case. Typically, we've found that flax will perform about half as well as glass fibre, even when you factor in its lower density. So with this being said, we have to acknowledge the fact that some of the environmental benefit of choosing this material will be offset by the fact that you're going to need to use more of it to achieve the same mechanical performance. So it's very unlikely that it would be the best choice in a weight critical application. But for less weight critical applications, the performance certainly is viable, which is why we're seeing more and more of its use in composites. Looking now at the reinforcements themselves then, these are made by Ecotechnilin and they are Europe's leading manufacturer of flax reinforcements. And here at Easy Composites, we're proud to be the exclusive distributor of these materials here in the UK and in the Netherlands from our EU warehouse. Of course, for international customers, we can also offer worldwide shipping. So with the range itself, we've got a few different formats. We've got our woven fabrics, which are all in a 2-2 twill. We've got non-wovens, which we've got a couple of different weights of. Then we've got the unidirectional. So we've got a stitch one here, and then one that's just held together with a binder. And then finally, we've got a unidirectional prepreg as well. So looking now at the wovens, these are available in three different weights. We've got 200 gram, 300 gram, and 550 gram. When you are specifying these materials, do bear in mind that they are quite low density and they don't compact particularly flat, so they will provide quite a lot more thickness than you might expect. For instance, the 550 gram material here would give you approximately 1.2 millimeters of thickness. Now looking at the non-wovens, we've got two different weights of these, a 300 gram and a 450 gram. These are short, randomly oriented strands, so they won't offer particularly good mechanical performance, but they are very easy to manipulate into contours and make an excellent sort of core material because you can take advantage of its low density. Then we have our stitched unidirectional. This one is a 180 gram and it has a very light cross stitch which holds the unidirectional fibers together and it's quite a robust material to work with. Then we have the bound unidirectional. So these don't have a cross stitch, they've just got a light binder keeping the fibers together. We offer this in a 50, 110 and 200 gram. And these are quite fragile to work with, but do have a very nice sort of 
almost plywood-like appearance when you use them in a layup. Then we've got our unidirectional prepreg. Now this does laminate and process like any conventional prepreg would. In fact, I made this shape here, you might recognize it from a previous video, just to demonstrate the sort of finish that you can get from an out of autoclave process. And I'm sure you'll agree the appearance is quite unique um, and the surface void content is very, very low. So I'm quite impressed with that. There are a few ways you can process flax though. The simplest being a straightforward hand layup. However, I probably wouldn't recommend doing that. The reason is it's quite an absorbent material. And so when you hand laminate this with resin, it will absorb the resin like a sponge and it becomes quite thick and can pull in a little bit from the sides. So if you're doing a hand layup, I suggest that you would back that up with a vacuum bag. And what that will do is keep it firmly consolidated and make sure that that sort of expansion isn't a problem. The most common way to process this though would be a resin infusion. And so let's demonstrate that on this chair molding. So this is the mold for the seat. It's made using the Unimold tooling system. And the first thing we need to do is apply the release agent. The release agent I'm using here is the CR1 Easy Lease Chemical Release Agent. I'm applying this in just the same way as you will have seen us do in many previous videos. So just wiping a thin film over the surface, wiping with a dry cloth if you need to, if there are any runs, and then repeating this six times, leaving 10 to 15 minutes between coats. While the release agent is finally curing off on the mold, we can get on and cut our reinforcement. Flax cuts like any other fabric and it doesn't require any specialist tools. So I'm just going to use a good quality pair of shears and then cut around a template that I've made from an off cut of breather. Before laying the reinforcement into the mold, I like to put the sealant tape on at this stage. And the reason for that is that at this point, I know that the mold flanges are completely clean. Later on, once I've got the fibre in there, there is a risk that a fibre would get underneath or onto the flanges where I'm about to put the seal, and that would of course compromise it. These pleats are formed to provide the excess of bag that's required to follow the contours without having to stretch. In this video, I'm only going to skip through the setup of the infusion, but if you are new to this process and want to learn more, have a look through some of our previous videos where we cover this in much more detail. When it comes to laying up with flax, it's much the same as any other reinforcement. The one major difference that you'll notice is that it doesn't drape around compound shapes quite as well as glass or carbon would. And that's down to the fact that the fibers are quite rough and so they don't slide over one another. So although they will go around the compound shapes, they tend to spring back out. So it can make handling a bit more difficult. And so if you're working on a very complicated shape, it's quite often the case that you'll have to use more cuts and sections to make the layout that bit easier. But in the case of this shape, I'm going to basically let the vacuum bag do the work. So I'll just be loosely placing this in position. And rather than trying to secure it all into place, I'll just let the vacuum draw down and that will force it into the compound shapes. A few spots of flash release tape will help to keep the material in overall position during the bagging stage. This particular laminate has three plies of 550 gram twill and all of these are stacked in just the same way and secured where needed. You can see that I've done a really loose job of laying the reinforcement into the mold. I certainly could have gone to more effort and positioned it with lots of bits of tape and spray tack to get it more closely following the contours. But as I mentioned earlier, you can let the vacuum do a surprisingly large amount of that work. So that's just what I'm going to do. Now at this point, this is where typically in a normal infusion with carbon, Kevlar or glass, you would go on and put a peel ply down followed by a mesh. And the purpose of the infusion mesh is to create channels that the resin can flow down before flowing into the fiber underneath. And without that mesh, the flow would be incredibly slow, meaning that resin infusion really wouldn't be possible. But flax is different. Because of the really rough, coarse nature of the fibers, it does create its own flow channels. And so we can do away with both the mesh and the peel ply and simply place a bag straight on top of it. Apart from that, we do need to have the other features that you would see in a resin infusion, like the feed spiral and the vacuum port located as you traditionally would. But in not having the mesh and the peel ply, we've not only saved those materials, but also the resin that they would have consumed. Here, I'm just moving the spiral so it's against the reinforcement. That way the resin can flow straight out from the spiral and into the main infusion. So over here on the vacuum line, we're going to just put in a resin break. So this is just a small piece of peel ply. I'm just going to place just off the surface of the part. 
And what that will do is when the resin is quickly flowing down through the fiber of the flax, it will then pretty much just stop. And that will allow us to maintain a vacuum into this area while the infusion is sort of evening up at the end of its flow. The vacuum bag is then sealed down to the tape, ensuring that there are absolutely no creases or loose fibers that could compromise the seal. And then the resin feed and vacuum line can be connected. I'm also connecting this vacuum gauge to give me a fast, accurate vacuum reading. As the vacuum is pulling down, I'm periodically shutting down the pump to allow me time to slide and adjust the flax and spiral into position before it's clamped down too firmly to move. Once positioned, a little more vacuum is pulled and then the positioning is repeated until I'm perfectly happy that there is no bridging and the reinforcement is pressed firmly into all of the contours and details of the mold. Once I'm happy that everything is in position properly, full vacuum is applied and tested. Flax, being a natural fibre, will absorb moisture from the atmosphere. And so when you do pull your vacuum down, you might notice that the vacuum doesn't pull down quite as quickly or quite as far as you might expect it to as if you were working with, say, carbon or glass. Now, the reason for that is that as we increase the vacuum level, we reduce the boiling point of water. And so any moisture that's in the fabric will be evaporating and boiling off, preventing the vacuum reaching its full level. Now, it's perfectly possible to pre-dry the material to do that two hours at 60 degrees in an oven will drive out nearly all of the moisture. But what that will also do is slightly reduce the drapeability and pliability of the material. So for a part like this, where we've got lots of small compound curves, I prefer to vacuum bag it down first and then leave it under vacuum to drive the moisture out. Now that does take a bit of time, so I'm going to leave this under full vacuum for five hours to get rid of most of that moisture in the fabric. We're now ready to mix the epoxy for the project. Although we could use any infusion epoxy, we're going to be using the IB2 bioresin. Now this doesn't compromise on performance over a traditional epoxy resin, it's just that some of the constituent chemicals that go into making it are derived from plants as opposed to from petrochemicals. So it could be used in a high performance carbon fiber or glass fiber application, but clearly it's very well suited to working with sustainable flax reinforcements. As with any epoxy, the IB2 needs to be accurately weighed out at the correct ratio and then thoroughly mixed for several minutes to ensure that it's completely combined. When you're calculating the amount of resin that you're going to need for a flax infusion, it will be more than you might be familiar with from carbon and glass. It does depend on the particular weave that you're using, but typically you're going to be aiming for a ratio of around about 33% fibre to 66% resin. So whatever weight you have in fibre, Double that and that will give you the amount of resin that you will need. Here I'm just securing the feed line to a stick so that it can be securely held into the bottom of the container without the risk of it falling out. Then the line can be unclamped and the resin allowed in to flow through the moulding. I will reiterate that running an infusion without a flow mesh like this is only possible due to the coarse and open weave that you find with a woven flax. It absolutely will not work like this with glass, carbon or Kevlar, where the flow rate would be far too slow for the infusion to complete before the resin starts to cure. The same applies to unidirectional flax. As it's not woven, the fibres will closely pack together under vacuum and massively reduce the flow rate. This wouldn't be a problem if you were combining unidirectional and woven together, but for a purely UD flax laminate, a flow mesh would still be needed. You can see that as the fibres are wetting out with resin, they do darken significantly. This is particularly pronounced in the woven materials, so if you're using this for a cosmetic application, it's worth bearing in mind that the final colour will be very different to the dry fabric. This part infused over a period of around 15 minutes. Once complete, the vacuum line can be clamped and the pump switched off. I've now clamped off the vacuum line and switched off the pump, but I am going to leave the resin feed line open for a few minutes longer, and that will just allow a bit more resin to flow in. That will take off some of the tension off the bag, and for cosmetic parts, it can be quite useful, because if you do have any slight air bubbles or cavities in there, they will shrink down and become almost invisible. Now that we're clamped off, this can be left to cure. That's going to take about 24 hours at room temperature. This is now fully cured, so we can tear it down and pop it from the mold. 
The resin cleanly cracking when flexed is a good indicator that the resin has cured sufficiently for demolding. Then the bag can be removed. I'm considering this vacuum bag to be a consumable, so I will be disposing of this after use. However, with very careful removal, it is possible to reuse the bag. In all honesty, I don't believe it's very practical to do this, and the actual amount of waste plastic produced is less than you would get in a drinks bottle. But if you're really trying to reduce waste as far as possible, then it's certainly something you could try. Demolding wedges are then inserted around the flange and the part easily pops from the mold. So here we have the part straight from the mold. I'm really pleased with the finish that we've got here. We've got no air voids, no air entrapment, and I really do like the warm appearance that the flax fiber gives. So let's take this through to the trim shop and get it trimmed up. I'm using a 32 mm permagrit wheel for the initial trim. Trimming flax is quite different to conventional composites. If you attempt to cut it with blunt tools or at too fast a rate, you can find that the edges will burn up in a similar way that plywood may do. In fact, it does feel a bit like a halfway between wood and fiberglass in this respect, and so I suggest using coarser teeth or grits than you normally would. The trim line can then be trued up with a flap wheel, hit with a sanding block, and then the edges softened down with wet and dry paper. Now that we're trimmed up, we've got our finished molding. As you can see, we've got a really nice appearance left by the flax fiber, and the 3.6 millimeter laminate that we've got here really is very strong and stiff, and it is stronger than a typical plastic, which is what these would normally be made from. If we look at the reverse of the part, we do have the finish that's been left directly from the vacuum bag. And if you look closely, you can see some lines where the creases in the bag have left marks on the part. Now, on a component where you're going to see both sides of it, like this really, it's probably worth considering using a peel ply. What a peel ply will leave you with, as you can see on this sample, is a rough matte texture on the back of the part, which is a lot more consistent and would look quite a lot neater. I chose not to use it for this project because I wanted to reduce the consumables as far as possible, but it might be something that you'd want to consider doing. So that's the molding completed, so this can be now fitted onto its legs and put into service. So that concludes our introduction to flax fibre and how it can be incorporated into various different projects. Whether that's for its environmental credentials, its vibration damping or simply its unique natural appearance. As we've covered, it isn't the answer to everything and for weight critical applications like in aerospace and motorsport, it's unlikely to be the best reinforcement choice. But in less weight critical applications, it certainly has some unique advantages, which is why we're likely to see much more use of it in the future. I hope we've got you thinking of ways that you might incorporate these materials into some of your projects. And if you do, remember that all of these materials, including the flax, the bioresin, the pumps and equipment, are available to buy online on the Easy Composites website. As ever, a huge thank you to all of our customers and subscribers for your support, and I'll see you next time. Of course, all of the equipment and materials that you've seen used in this video can be ordered online from the Easy Composites website. If you're based in the EU, you can now order directly from our Netherlands warehouse on easycomposites.eu and for the UK and the rest of the world, please visit easycomposites.co.uk.